Welcome back to another segment of Ask Me Anything. We had so many folks join our Facebook group in the last month and a half that I had to dedicate several Mindset Mondays to this topic of, you know, how are we going to raise these, these kids so that they're resilient, so that they thrive, so that, you know, our daily life experience with the children is much more pleasant and has more ease and joy. I, I'm a parent educator, Vanessa Callahan, lead coach at Raising Our Resilience. And I'm here to share with you tried and true, strateg tried and true strategies and tools that you know parents that I've worked with or, or even within the classroom experience of facilitating for 15 years, um, but hundreds of families have now considered and some have even adopted and seen progress and seen major changes. I was just speaking with one of my clients in a session just now and you know, we've only been working together for about a month and they're already seeing major progress after their second uh, session with me. And one of the things that stood out I wanted to share before we dive in to all the questions and um, topics for today um, is that just getting into the mindset that change is possible, that we as parents can absolutely influence our experience of daily life with kids, whether it is the kids, like, you know, some, some things that we might normally feel sort of resigned to, or like, oh, that's just how siblings do. They always fight and they, they hit each other and it's not a big deal. We could just kind of resign ourselves into like, well, I guess that's how it is when you have, you know, three boys, for example, um, or, or, there's an opportunity to say, hey, actually, I don't, that feels really chaotic and unsafe. And I'm, I'm worried about my kids maybe going to camp or having friends over and other kids getting hurt too. And generally, this is just not how I want my children to solve their problems, right? Using their hands. Um, I would love for them to have more tools and skills. And when, when you realize that that's something that you can influence, whether it's in the moment that it's happening, having some great ways to stay calm, having some great ways to sort of hold the line or bring, you know, bring to with the awareness what the agreement is between um, family members about how we're going to handle anger, for example, or if it's being really proactive and doing things like having a conversation about what does it look like to do no harm. What does it look like to solve our problems in a productive way that doesn't lead to, you know, more more harm and more hurt. So. I'd invite you to take, take a little time today to hang with me as I'm answering some really key questions. And um, if you're here on Zoom, let me know, say hello. If you're here on the, in the Facebook group, just let me know, where, where are you tuning in from? What are, the, what are the ages of your kids? And if you have a question, this is your opportunity to ask questions as well. Um, but I'll be, I'll be addressing several from our members as we go. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and put some of these questions in so that folks can find, can find this. Um, and it looks like we might need to tag them later, but I'll go ahead and put the questions up so everyone can kind of see what we're up to today. So the first question is for uh, Sarah Smallwood Crabtree. So, um, I'm going to be answering your question here and she looks like it. She has an 11 and 14 year old and at 11 and 14, she's noticing that um, her younger one can get really upset if things don't go her way. And that can be a problem, right? Because um, I'm going to be answering your question here because um, it can be challenging then to feel like you can have a productive way forward if there's one child who, as soon as she doesn't get what she wants, or he, uh, yeah, she um, doesn't get what she wants, she, like, her anxiety comes up, or no, it looks like she cries and screams and throws things, and then if the older one is also similar, <laughs> then I can just imagine that there's this sort of, like, um, escalation that happens between the two of them. If you can relate to Sarah's um, struggle here, like, let her know in the comments and let us know where you're tuning in from, okay? Yeah, even if it's replay, you can put like, you know, replay. So we know that you're with us um, watching the replay. And uh, what I can say about this is that when you, you have kids who have run, have, have run with quite a bit of anxiety, um, it can be really challenging um, in the moment to sort of soothe them, yeah? And what, what I found is that if you are able to make a little bit of a, of a like what well, I would call a resilience plan with your child. A resilience, 
if you're able to make a resilience plan with your child, what ends up happening is that they have an easier time being able to draw on the wisdom that is in their bodies, that's in their minds about the need to reset their nervous system. Yeah. And so when, when extreme upset happens, it's, it's usually not something that kids are choosing. They're not like, now I'm going to get extremely upset. And then they start to scream and cry, right? Think about the last time you got really upset and you can ask your kids this, did you choose to get upset? Like, no, right? And I talk about this in my meltdowns and tantrums and power struggles uh, webinar that I run here in the group, you know, with, with the group, it's a free event or I do it at schools. And I talk about the fact that we flip our lids and when we flip our lids, it's usually automatic. It's not necessarily something you're choosing. And so being aware of the fact that it's not a choice can oftentimes help you to um, shift into the kind of observer position, like the, the person who can observe the meltdown happening rather than the person, like rather than the meltdown happening to you and you have no control. So that oh, shifting to that awareness can be part of your resilience plan, for example, and saying like, notice when you're having an emotion that's running really strongly and it starts to kind of run the show and it's not your choice, right? Um, and what are, and then I would ask your 11 year old in particular, but probably for both of them, what are some signs that this is happening? What are some signs that your lid is flipping? Um, and start to like notice what your sort of your tells are that you're starting to flip your lid. Okay. And I use the flip the lid metaphor because it's so powerful. It's based on Dr. Daniel Siegel. If you want to look him up, he's great. Um, and I also teach his brain in the palm of the hand model anytime I'm talking about meltdowns because it's been such a useful metaphor for kids as young as four, five, six, all the way up to the teens and even us adults. There are times when I'm like, I think my lid is coming off right now. So helping kids realize like, what are their tells? Like, first of all, I have a lid and it, it can automatically flip, but what are some of my tells? Like, what are some signs that my lid is starting to flip? Yeah, because when you start to um, get ahead of the, the meltdown, um, that's really helpful. You know, um, like imagine your, your 11 year old saying something like, I'm, I'm, I think I'm getting really mad about not getting the whatever is that she wants or not getting my way. Huh, I think my lid is flipping. I need to take a few deep breaths, <laughs> right? Like that is so much better than just going straight into the crying and screaming. Now let's say that, that it happens so quickly. How many of you have a zero to 60 child or maybe you yourself are a zero to 60 person where you have, I call it a quick lid. You just have a quick lid. And it's something that maybe over time you're gonna be able to bring that down and, and have, it, have it be a slower process of getting upset where you can kind of pause before you get all the way there. But it's so important that you're able to, you know, um, acknowledge that you have a lid and that it flips quickly and part of your resilience plan could be, you know, catching it even while it's happening, even if you weren't able to get ahead of it, right? And so I can imagine for your 11 year old, uh, Sarah, one of the things you might start to ask her is, is there something about that, like when her lid flips, like what's the best thing that you can do to support her? And um, don't ask her when she's in the middle of it because that, that, that part of like the way her brain is functioning right then, she's not going to come. She's like, give me what I want is probably what she's going to say or get away from me or something, you know, something that's not helpful um, exactly. But, you know, perhaps there is a give me some space could be one of the options or what, you know, for her to like do no harm by like putting her hands down, closing her mouth and walking away until she finds a way to be calmer and come back without yelling. For an 11 year old, totally reasonable expectation that she could, she could start to build that in as a skill and as a plan. So we've got Brandy here. Hi, Brandy. Brandy's one of our parents in our immersion. She is a bonus parent to a five and two year old. So good to have you here. And she's saying that one thing that's going on a lot is a lot of whining mm, from the five year old and now the two year old is modeling after him. We talked about this last week a bit, Brandy. I think you were here for that too, where you know, having the elder model behaviors that you don't want your younger one to learn can be so disheartening, like disappointing. And then you can, what it, what, what it can do, the opportunity is it puts a little fire under your butt to address it because 
it's one thing if it's happening and it's just irritating to you, but it's another thing if it's being like, kind of like now learned behavior for the younger kid. So I hear you on this. I used to use, used to hold my elders in my classroom to really high standards as, that they were ready for, of course, by helping bring to mind that they're showing the younger ones the ropes, right? Now at five, he's probably in a bit of a transition where he's not going to be able to hold that perspective all the time. So using, using the like, be a leader, be a big brother, show your younger sibling, um, the, you know, isn't always going to be the, the most impactful. So you might consider instead just addressing the whining in general, um, just like more directly actually. Um, and what I, what I love to do with a little one is just um, not respond to whining. I know this is really hard. And what I mean is that you don't actually respond to what they're saying Instead, you address the fact that there's whining happening, right? So you just say, oh, wow, it seems like you really want something or it seems like you really want to tell me something. Um, let's, find your, let's find your regular voice. Let's find your calm voice. Um, and then I can hear you. And it's like, and I, I'll actually literally say, I'm like, I, I can't really listen to you when you're using that voice. Can you try again? Are you ready to use your, re your regular voice? Oh, might you need something right now? Like a hug? Or maybe like we could take a little break from this. Um, because what we're building in often with whining is a tolerance for frustration, a tolerance of the frustration that comes with the no. When we say no, they get frustrated and they start to whine, right? So um, it's not that whining is wrong. It's just that it's not an effective way to communicate what you need and get what you want. And so we don't want to give them what, they, what they're asking for when they're using the whiny voice as much as possible. You'll redirect them to a calmer voice. Oh, you're very welcome, Brandy. So glad to support you. Um, Patty's here. Patty, your little one's one month old already. Unbelievable. Um, so Patty tuned in for our six day training last month while she was in the hospital about to have a baby. So, so excited you're here, Patty. We should chat. I've been texting you, let's, let's, get, let's get connected. Um, and uh, also in the Bay Area here with me, and also with a three-year-old. Awesome, Patty, if you have a question, throw it in the chat. Um, oh, Lee and I were just uh, chatting. Yeah, good to have you here. <laughs> oh, Brandy, Brandy and Lee are both in um, families, uh, part of families that are in my year-long immersion that we're kicking off this month. Um, yeah, okay, so Bernadette says, welcome Bernadette. Um, you have four-year-olds who have tantrums and get physical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And oh yeah, your, your daughter's daycare is closing and she's starting to have regular tantrums um, and hitting and kicking you specifically. Bernadette, I'm so glad you're here. You can definitely help with this. So we've been chatting a bit about what it's like to kind of get ahead of the meltdown or get, you know, kind of help kids notice that they're having them. And uh, I was talking to Sarah who has an 11 year old and now uh, with your four year olds, it's gonna be a lot about like co-regulation have you heard of co-regulation before, Bernadette, or anybody else who's listening? Patty, Brandy, Lee, I wonder. Um, I think we we brought it up in the six-day training, but I'm not sure if you caught it. So co-regulation is when you lend your nervous system to young children so that they can regulate with you. And so one of the first things you could do is um, connect with them and and call and, and do something that's very calming. Right, so kind of connecting before you correct. So you're like, you're like, you know, being right there, and I, I like, I see you, and you might hold her and say, "Let me hold your hands," and then she tries to keep hitting you. Then you might step away and say, "I see you, honey, breathing," and she comes at you again. You've tried the co-regulating piece, okay? So just giving you one thing that might be kind of on your tool belt that you take out is like something that where you're modeling how to calm down, modeling how to maybe put her hands down modeling how to, like she puts her hands in yours, could be something that you ask for instead of hitting and kicking because just reframing that hitting and kicking is a form of communication at that moment. It is also something that's out of bounds that you don't want, that you will have a limit about, I'm sure, Bernadette, right? Um, but just saying like, uh, give me your hands, sweetheart, let me help you. Give me your hands, sweetheart, let me help you. You're not ready to give me your hands. Okay, then I'm gonna need to. I'm gonna need to go over there until you're ready, or you're gonna need to go into this other room until you're ready and calm. And you can give me your hands or put your hands in on your on, on your in your pockets. It's because it's 
it, if, if they were, if she were running away and throwing things, that would show me that I need, I need space and I don't want to connect with you. But I think that the hitting and kicking means that she's trying to like get her anger across to you or a frustration. And so holding her hands can be a way to like stay connected, but it's, it, she's not, she's not going to be able to hit with those hands or kick. Okay. But then separating with her and saying, you can come and find me when you're ready can be really helpful because that way it gives her something like something that she takes it back on that she's got to calm herself down before she comes back to you. Um, and, and also like you, you can get a little strong if she keeps coming at you, you can be like, Hey, and I love this when a kid is like trying to be really physical with your body, you can actually put up your hand like this and you don't push them away. You like move your own body away to give yourself a whole arm's length of space so that they literally can't, I mean, they might still interact with your hand, but they're not going to be able to get to like the, the, the middle of your body and hit and kick you or your face. And if you give yourself that space and go, hey, not okay, I'm here to help you. Can you give me your hands? No? Okay, then I'm gonna need to make some more space until you're ready. Can you, or can you put your hands in your pockets? Okay, no? All right, then maybe it's time for us to go to the calm down corner. <laughs> so Bernadette, I've given you a little, some ideas there. Um, and then also like, this is just in the moment, you have to always be thinking when, when a child is having these tantrums and things, what conditions are leading to it? Like what, what could be going on? Is it that because she's not in daycare, you know, um, something's different about her schedule now. And so it, I would just be curious, Bernadette, is this happening at a certain time of day? Is there, is there something about the structure of the day that's shifted? Because little ones are particularly sensitive to their biorhythms being consistent. So if, for example, she has a nap time or a quiet hour at daycare, but she's not getting it at, at home, you might want to try playing with building that back in, for example, or a snack time um, or something that you think would be really nourishing for her. Okay, so keep keep rolling in the in the chat in the comments, Bernadette. If there's more, okay, I'm gonna jump to the next question though. So this is, um, let's see, ah, Priscilla, Noel, Dre. I have another one for you. You're welcome, Bernadette. It says, how do I manage my time uh, my time to be with my child and have a work life balance? And this is not your exact question friends, but it's close. <laughs> um, it was sort of like the theme that the three of you had. So by the way, you're in good company. And that's part of why I tagged you all together. <laughs> um, so let's just say that this is like, these are like some life hacks that I'm going to be sharing with you. And we all need them. I mean, you know, like, this is something that I build into my programs as well about like, how do you actually find time for me time? How do you actually um, get you know, GSD, get stuff done when you're a parent. Um, and also anybody right now who's here, who wants to add some notes to this question, things that have worked for you, either with the meltdowns piece, or now we're rolling into, or the whining, rolling into now um, how to create that work-life balance. There's so much that uh, we have, wisdom we have right here in the group. So I always love for you all to contribute your thoughts too. It doesn't always have to come like in this direction. If that makes sense, we can have more if we all add in. So the first thing I would say is that you've got to be in tune with at least one thing that you are really passionate about, something that really lights you up. And if you are able to stay in touch with at least one thing that you're passionate about, one thing that is um, that you would actually prioritize and like make time for it, um, you're much more likely to then actually do it. And then once you do it, it's like the snowball effect that happens. Absolutely. Like for me, it's gardening. Like if I make time, like I get up a half an hour earlier and I go and I garden for like 20 to 30 minutes longer than I would have, like usually just water a little bit or something. And I actually get to like plant little baby lettuces and like I did this morning and put the little slug bait around it so that it doesn't get eaten up and adjust the little timer. Like I am having such a good day right now because I built that in for myself, just something that really lights me up. And then I got really excited about thinking about all the different other things that I can do in that zone of my life, gardening and such. Um, so just like let there be that joy and there, that passion, even if you feel like you're, and especially when you feel like your plate is so full, it's hard to juggle life and work because you deserve it. 
yeah, like life, the time you have on the planet is so precious. And the other thing I would, I would invite you to do is consider like, if there's something you're really passionate about, it can be me time, but it can also be teach your child something time or like do like show involve them, have them do one thing. Like there's a seven-year-old in my household. And one thing I've had, had her do like in the gardening space is just like, when I need a water, like have her come and, and, and water. And then I can chat with her about all the different ways to take care of the plants and things, and then start involving her in, in the little steps so that she can get more and more independent in the garden and have a really good time there. And it's a way for her and I to bond, but then she also gets some skills. And then I still have that garden time. Whereas maybe my idea of spending time with her could, might, might've been a little bit more um, traditional of like, oh, I need to sit and play her toys with her. But instead I'm actually scooping her up into my area of passion to like expose her to something that's new and that she ended up really liking. Um, so that's one thought on the life work balance. Um, there's more, uh, another thing I can say is that once you do have that joy and that passion happening in your schedule and your time, and you, and you even like share it with your kids and see how, see how that can um, all connect. Another thing that you can do around the balance is it's a lot, it's a deeper practice around boundaries. And so I know right now in particular, and I need, I would need to hear more about your, your situation, but um, there's a lot less boundaries between work and home life because of all the working from home or the shelter in place where kids are learning virtually at home, or we've just been stuck inside together all the time. And so kind of reestablishing some boundaries around like when you are available and when you're not available. And we were just actually, Lee and I were jamming about this today a little bit. Um, and I've, I've talked to probably much all of my clients about, about this. And, and during the pandemic, we discussed this at least four or five times in the group right here, which is this idea of sort of like creating um, like a little mini routine around how to, how to establish that like you are not available and they were going to be focusing on something else, especially if your children are younger, but even when they're older, like I have a client who has a 11 year old daughter and um, they ended up sharing a whiteboard schedule in the mornings and like writing out their day. And she would actually color code and kind of block off certain parts where she's like, I'm gonna be in meetings and I'm gonna be unavailable. So if you need something, it has to only you have to like wait unless it's an emergency. And even then go ask, you know, like call your grandfather first, unless it's like, you know, something bleeding or burning. But if it's urgent, you know, like see if he can help you first during those blocks of time, otherwise you will need to wait. And just like setting up those expectations. Also it helped her to be like more productive than ever during those blocks of time, because it's like she earned it. She like, she like put a stake in the ground of like, this is my work time, you know? Um, and then if you have younger, younger ones where you can't necessarily plan it out on a whiteboard and get their like verbal agreement ahead of time and like you can see that they comprehend it, um, it's really important for them to know that you're like in work mode and there's some things you can play with there. You can like wear a different, you can like put on a necklace, you put on a hat, you can like, you know, somebody actually put up like a little mini fence <laughs> and that it's closed, like the, like mom shop is closed, <laughs> you have to come back later. Um, and check when the gates open kind of thing. Um, open and closed is a language that little ones can usually understand pretty well. I've used it in the preschool for five years and I know they still use it at the school I, I used to work at. Um, and what we end up doing is we end up like training our kids and I mean training in the, like the sweetest way of like guiding them to understand that like there are times when people can, can, can drop what they're doing and be with them. And there's times when they, they actually need to like cope with the fact that you, you were not going to jump up and do what they want, you know? Um, so tolerating that, that waiting experience, like we were talking about tolerating the no earlier of not getting what you want is a, is a big life skill. So I think we can feel guilty. How many of you can feel guilty when you turn a child away? Cause it's like, well, they want my attention and they want to connect and they need something. They need me. And sometimes even that role is more appealing than what work we're doing. So we're like gladly dropping it. <laughs> but then our work life suffers and then we're up until nine o'clock and 10 o'clock at night or later and we're not sleeping well enough. And then we get into this bad cycle of not taking care of ourselves. So let me tell you this, that it's actually a serve. It's you're doing your kid a favor. You're doing your kid a service by helping them understand that people aren't endlessly available, that they may need to wait 
before they get to have your attention or your, your undivided, um, you know, sort of um, company. Um, and that there's a polite way to interrupt. Um, little ones, I've, sometimes it takes three years to train them and to get them in the, in the groove of like noticing that you're already doing something before they just come and like try to get your attention. Um, and we can model this for them too, where if they're in the middle of something, we don't just constantly interrupt them and expect them to drop things and come to us when we call their name or when we want them to. Um, and one thing, one thing that really helps is just to kind of create like an interrupting routine where like the child will put their hand on your shoulder and then maybe you put your hand on their hand to let them know that you know they're there, but they're supposed to wait. Yeah, and some kids take to that like first try, others years, but it's worth it over time because what it does is it builds a more mature approach to communication. Yeah, like actually noticing that the person that you're talking to or want, want, want to uh, connect with is in the middle of something. How many have had a coworker who's oblivious of that and constantly interrupted you, even if you're in the middle of an email, on the phone, like clearly busy, back turned, head down, and they're still talking at you? Like I've had that happen <laughs> in my professional life. And I actually was like, had to like, I put, I ended up putting on like headphones to prompt them. Like, I'm not, like, I'm not going to hear you if you just start talking at me. Even if I sometimes could, I would just like ignore it to try to help this coworker understand that like, I'm not just like a, a person, I'm not like an object you can just pick up and use anytime you want. Like I might be in the middle of something. Um, there's some other ideas, but I wanna make sure we get to everybody. So I hope that's a good place to start. Another can be to map out your routine, like map out your schedule um, on a regular basis until it just sort of gets internalized. Um, we do that in the immersion, like we're working on that this month and we'll revisit it again in January. When we kick off the next cohort because it's a good time to revise our routines as we like integrate New Year's goals and maybe school things change. So yeah, doing some workshopping on your routines can also really help you to manage your time. It just helps you get ahead of it um, and have more family understanding like that mom who like would, you know, color code that block of time of like not available. Um, you can establish those things more proactively. Yeah, yeah, Brandy says, it's so true, it amazes her that adults that have zero awareness on the I'm busy, not available cue, right? Yeah, and it's like, how do we do it kindly, right? Like, I mean, there were times where I just wanted to shoot a look, <laughs> like really, you know? Um, but instead I'm just like, I think they, like I just need to bring it to their awareness. See, so, um, hey, I'm, um, just, I need about five minutes. I'm in the middle of something, you know, just to be able to say that to an adult or an older child is so helpful. Um, with a little one, you can say, oh, remember, take their hand and put it on your shoulder. If five is not too young. I've had three, four and three and four year olds to be successful at this brandy. So you absolutely can. And it's not the expectation for a five year old is not to uh, consistently notice that you're busy, but to consistently be open to you redirecting them to waiting whether that's waiting with their hand on your shoulder or waiting with their hand on your hip or waiting by like leaving and coming back in a few minutes, like those kinds of things, you can absolutely redirect a five-year-old too and even a four and three-year-old. Yeah. Yep. And just know it takes time. It's not going to be the first time and definitely don't be offended <laughs> if it takes like 20 to 50 times. It could. You really could. Um, this next question is from Irma, Melanie. Um, and I'm sure a lot of folks want to know more about how to motivate your kids to cooperate and do their chores or school work. Ah, motivation, you're singing my, my favorite song. Um, so the long answer is that I have a five, I have a three day training on this. So that's what we're doing as immersion members this weekend is we're talking all about motivation mastery strategies. And we're going to be focusing on ways to motivate kids from within so that it's like there are less, less and less need for rewards and bribing and negotiating and punishments and consequences and things like that as the way that we motivate. Because the, the truth of the world is that even though there are some things that we are motivated by rewards and we're motivated by sort of like avoiding consequences for sure, that's there, but it's probably not the way we want our kids to like live their lives. Like think of different different environments that your child could end up in as a young adult. You know, do you feel like it's the best lifestyle or outcome for them 
to be in an environment where there's always either a reward or a punishment kind of hanging over them to motivate them. Or I say always, right? I don't mean never. Um, or, <laughs> and it's not a never, like there are sprinkles of rewards and punishments perhaps or consequences in the environment, but there's also a lot of like passion and interest and uh, desire to improve and uh, meaning and purpose and, um, you know, a sense of like having a great impact on others and on your own life, like as a motivator and that being like what's really running the show. So most folks would prefer the second version, right? Where there might be rewards and consequences sprinkled in there, but it's not like what keeps you up at night and keeps you going in the morning, um, right? So I'm so glad that you brought this up. So a few things you can do, and this is something that I, I always invite folks to think about, especially my clients, but anybody who comes into contact with me is, um, when you're trying to motivate them, are you jumping to suggestions too quickly? Like, are you coming up with a solution for motivation um, for them or are you involving them in the process? And so for example, like a chore, like uh, vacuuming, right? Like, are you coming to them like, well, how about if I pay you a dollar every time you vacuum the floor? It's, it's nice that you're thinking of something to motivate them and maybe reward them, right? But I wonder about taking a different approach where you get into their world a bit, right? Um, where you ask them questions like, well, what is it about vacuuming that you like and that you don't like? Um, do you what do you think of our vacuum cleaner? Like, does it seem like it has all the tools that it needs to, you know, that you need to be able to, for us to be able to clean the floor? Or like, how do you think this floor gets so dirty in the first place? Like just kind of getting into their head and their world, just like to see what their perspective is, because they might be like, I don't know because they literally have no connection to why vacuuming even is a thing. And that's really good information for you to realize like, wow, if I'm just going to be sort of rotely demanding this of my, of my child, um, it, it's probably not gonna stick with them, right? It's just gonna be this thing that they have to do and they're gonna probably drag their feet and complain every time and you're gonna have to nudge them along or kind of even nag them. Oh, hey, Sonia, I see that you're here on Zoom. Nice to have you, hon. Um, one of my smart clients that I'm working with. Well, anyway, um, so what can we do to get into their world and get a sense of like, what? how do they even relate to this chore? How do they even relate to this assignment and homework? Get into their world is the number one thing, first and foremost, yeah. And then, you know, show that you understand like, oh, well, of course you don't really notice anything about the vacuum, you know, vacuuming because you have, you don't have a lot of experience with having to clean up after other people. Like I do, I'm cleaning up after everyone all the time. Um, or that makes sense. Like the floors, the floors are going to get dirty anyway. So why do we keep cleaning it? Like I hear you, like there's something that's kind of funny about why we clean it all the time. Right. Well, let me tell you about what happens to carpets when you don't clean them regularly. And like, you can even like call a carpet professional and say, excuse me, like, how often do you recommend after getting our carpets clean to vacuum? And they always say like at least once a week. And you can say, oh, that's interesting, why? You know, <laughs> So kind of getting curious about it <laughs> and, and showing some understanding of like, well, with your limited information, child, like, of course you have these ideas, like, and I'm here for that. I'm here for us to talk about it. And then you can actually run it through, you know, some problem solving. And that's where you could say things like, do we need to make this more interesting? Um, is there some skill that you don't know that you need, you need some help that I can teach you with? And I have a five part, you know, like series of questions that I'm going to be training my motivation mastery folks this weekend on that kind of goes through that, that those those pieces. Sonia, yeah, I know you have this in your coaching, your coaching notes too, the, the I care model. Um, and you start to have a very, like a much different conversation. Now, why go to all this trouble? Why not just make it a requirement and make the kids do it? Well, you can do that. Then I'm not discouraging you from doing that when you need to and, um, or when it just seems like the right thing to do. Like, I'm not discouraging you, but I should say, and I would pick a couple things that could be an opportunity for the two of you to kind of build some more communication and rapport around having these more lively informed discussions because without them, other things are gonna be hard to talk about too. So this is like laying some groundwork for your relationship and how you communicate, which Sonia knows a lot about. She's had several amazing breakthroughs with her daughter, so proud of it. Um, and, uh, 
it kind of it gives them the opportunity to come into contact with ways they can motivate themselves. Like, wouldn't you love the, a person to say, you know, I'm a person, one of your kids to grow, you know, to be like a young adult in the world or even a tween or maybe even like at eight and nine, I've seen this where they go, huh, funny, I really don't feel like doing this right now. Could it be that I'm hungry or lonely or tired? I need a snack. And then they go get a snack and then they come back and they do the assignment. Like I didn't even have to intervene because I we've already, we've, I've, I've taken an interest and asked those questions and gotten into his world and got him to think about what might I need right now, first of all. Second of all, like um, what and asking questions like, well, what could make this more interesting? Oh, if I could build a model of it when I'm done, like a science project or something, like a science research question, if I could build a model of it when I'm done using those cool paints that you got, like that would make it more interesting. And I'm like, great. So let's let's see, let's get you through the writing assignment. What help might you need? Can we break it down into steps, which is like the C in I care, the competence piece. Um, to get you to this goal that's gonna, that, that now you're sparked up and interested, you get to build this model of a volcano and like, can we even make it explode? It's like, yeah, why not? Let's figure that out. Let's see what you might need to bring from home. And we can even do a demo during our free time on Friday afternoon for all the other kids. You know, I've seen this go from like motivation almost zero to motivation like a hundred just by helping them ask those questions. And then I've seen those same kids then roll that over into the next time they get stuck. Yeah. So what I'm inviting you into the opportunity here is like imparting motivation tools to your kids um, where it's not just about rewarding themselves or punishing themselves or, or others, um, but you know, kind of using these other tried and true ways of sort of boosting motivation for things that are worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's not always like achievement things too, like homework and you know, getting chores done. Sometimes it's like motivated to do a brave thing like reaching out to a friend who hasn't called you back in a while. Like there's all these other ways that we can be resilient and, mo resilient and motivated that can give us like a thriving life. Yes. All right, so on to the next question. Anybody has any comments or chats, let me know. Sonia, if you wanted to chime in at all. I know we've talked a lot about how to motivate and communicate and like make plans together. Like I think the biggest breakthrough you shared with me recently is like how much you and your daughter are having these conversations where you're really just a team, like a true team. And even when, you know, things are happening that you both don't like, like you're able to walk through it together and it just feels different. So anything you wanted to add, I know you might just be listening in, but let us know. <laughs> ah, so um, we have three that are really related. So I'm gonna kind of put them up all together. So it is, they are, let me see, to do, and I think I still need to, to tag Steph in this one. All right, so how do I manage my child's frequent mood swings and big emotions? This is really familiar, similar to the meltdown one we started with for Sarah. Um, also your child's tantrums, we talked about a bit as well. Um, and how do I manage a very sensitive child? So you can see how these are all related to things that we've talked about. So kind of reviewing real quick, um, just looking at you know how, how are, <laughs> How, what, what, do we, what do we understand about how our brains work, right? Uh, do we know enough about how our brains work to be able to you know, really support, support um, kids in making sense of their big emotions, yeah, and their tantrums? Um, oftentimes we skip that part and then we just go to making it stop. And it turns out that there are a lot of like cognitive strategies that really help us to be able to not only um, we do end up sort of getting them to stop in a way um, by putting that lid back on. But we also get to like make sense of the experience so that it's it goes a little deeper than just um, getting it to stop. Yeah. And and what what that ends up doing is building up a whole like sort of library of information about how how our nervous systems work so that we can start to do things that are really proactive. Yeah like build in that self-care where you get to do that thing you're passionate about. I was talking about earlier, um, learning specific calm down tools like we did last month for, for all those months so that you can either co-regulate or you can redirect them, the kids to use that calm down strategy. Um, and then there's also like being able to hold that line firmly um, and lovingly always giving kids the opportunity to step into what they need, whether that's calming down or stepping away or taking a break or 
you, you getting to hold their hands or, um, you know, taking breaths with you, um, stepping them into that. Another thing I can share is um, this body of work around like emotion coaching. And this is something that if you want to have a copy of, you just need to take my quiz and check the little yes box. And I can show you what that looks like in a few minutes, but um, I'll just make sure to put the link in the chat. Even, you know, if you've taken this, but it's been a while, you can also take it again, just to see what happens. Um, has anything changed, right? Um, oh, it's not really letting me do it um, on Facebook right now. So I'll have to share that later. But um, so the quiz, it helps, helps you just kind of look at what are some areas that are strong? What are some areas that are challenges and how might you have a breakthrough around it? And there's an opportunity to also apply for a session with me, which can be really fun. Um, Patty, Brandy, Lee have all had them before. Sonia, who's here, um, all had that breakthrough session. And it's a lot of how, you know, like at least three of you ended up like working with me in, you know, either in private coaching or in the immersion because we just got really clear on like, wow, there's so much to learn here, how exciting. Um, where, and also talk, have some real talk about what's, what's uniquely challenging in your family or your temp the temperaments of the, in the personalities or ages, or you know, I've got families that are single parent families, two households, intergenerational, uh, multiracial, you know, just all kinds of dimensions of um, you know, intersectionality that can contribute to um, you know, a unique experience as a parent and as a family unit. So co-parents, other, other caregivers as well. So yeah, we'll, we'll get that quiz uh, linked to you as soon as uh, I'm allowed. <laughs> all right, so uh, Emotion Coaching Kids is all about helping them tune into their, tune into and name their emotions. And it's just, it's tuning into their bodies as well as their thoughts. And so that's called like physiological and psychological responses to the trigger. Fancy words for what's going on. How are you feeling in your body? What, how is your, what, what, what thoughts is your mind producing all in, t in that same idea of like helping identify like where, how far is my lid off? How am I actually doing here? Yeah. And then from there, excuse me, taking a moment to say like, there's something that makes sense about this. Not to say to indulge it, like, yeah, I should be mad. Let me get more mad. Because sometimes, although sometimes that's a good thing, but generally, like, we're trying not trying to necessarily escalate big emotions because they're already big. And what we probably need is to cool down and make sense of what happened. And then see if there is an inspired action that needs to come from that anger or if there is some kind of care or comfort that's needed from that sadness or that fear. Yeah. And, and you can do something productive with that, with that signal that your body's giving you of distress. Other times it's just, we need to calm down because it's not about anything important. <laughs> we're just, we just have a trigger and maybe we can address the trigger later, but for now we're just going to get away from the spider, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, so then, okay, so you tune in and you can even say things like, wow, I see your face is getting, your cheeks are really red and your fists, your hands are like fists. It looks like you might be angry. Did I get that right? And then, you know, you can get, maybe get some confirmation or maybe that makes them more angry and you can say, you don't have to push it, but you can just say, mm, okay, it feels like there's some anger here, you know, <laughs> um, and that you might need something, you know? Um, so just acknowledging that and then maybe even saying, well, that kind of makes sense because you're really hot right now. And I know that when I'm hot, I can get really angry too, you know, even from, even if there's nothing really big that's happening, for example, something to validate it, like what makes sense about this? Because here's the deal. If you go straight into fighting, picking a fight with feelings, you'll usually lose. And not only that, a feeling is so like, so insistent on being seen and heard and understood that it'll probably get louder and bigger and we'll, we'll dig in. <laughs> so I say, don't pick a fight with a feeling, please. Like just like acknowledge that it's here and, and, and you, can, you can draw a line on the behaviors, but I wouldn't make it about, don't be mad, don't be so sad. You don't need to be this, you don't need to be that. You can just let them know that it makes sense that it's here and show some empathy for that. And then the last thing, last piece I'll give you is um, guide them towards some kind of coping tool. And this isn't something that you always know what to guide them towards. It can be a months long process of discovery. I even have had clients who've been with me for two years 
discovering new coping tools that they didn't really want to consider before, but they realize are really important that they start to use in their lives. So um, just kind of be down for the lifelong journey <laughs> of learning like all these different ways that you get to comfort yourself, you get to deescalate, you get to help your children deescalate because they are a moving target, right? Kids are always changing and growing and having different attitudes and perspectives. So what works right now, maybe in three months they'll be over it and they need a new breathing tool. They need a new way to move their body so that they can get the tension out. Like, you know, being open to that, just in this process of discovering a really good tool. But the important thing is to find something. Yeah, because um, without it, it can definitely just like, the big emotion can just kind of take over and then there's like nothing, like how do you move that energy, right? And it can get worse, it can escalate when you really are way off, right? Like if you want, like a kid who who like, like you, you maybe for you, like physical touch is really comforting, but like, and you keep offering hugs and they, they, they're refusing it and you try to touch them and they get more mad at you. Well, that could be like a hundred bad moments, right? Easily. So you got to move on and find something else that really does match what your kids need that you're also comfortable with. Um, and when it comes to a very sensitive child, what I would say is being, um, yes, Brandy, thank you. Uh, sorry, let me say this first. So asking a question to empower them to, to their own solution. Yes, I'm so good. What can we do, sweetie, to feel a little bit better right now? And the opportunity that I've been inviting everyone in the immersion and I know everyone in my world to do is to like sprinkle in these coping tools and we'll go into this even more in the winter in our emotional mastery weekend for anyone who joins the january cohort that's like our first like three day deep dive um of the immersion it's like um we're gonna fill up your tool chest with all of these coping tools that is not it's like you get to just weave them into the fabric of daily life so they're just something that you just you just do like you like i garden not when i'm angry only or when I'm sad or upset or something, I, I garden proactively <laughs> to fill up my, to kind of fill up my, my sort of self-care bucket. Um, I try not to wait until I've, I've run out. <laughs> it's an empty, right? Um, and so if you have a sensitive child, kind of coming back to that, um, and then in this moment, Brandy, like they'll, they'll, they'll be able to access ideas of like what could make them feel better right a little bit better right now if they practice them more. So like the exploding star or the roller coaster breath or any of the things that you learned in the sixth day last month. And um, hopefully we're gonna be having another one of those this fall. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of looking at October for those of you who are interested. Um, yeah, like you can make a bunch of suggestions but you can also say like, I remember last time or like remember we practiced that roller coaster breath, maybe this is a good time to try it, you know? And kind of like bringing it back up because what it turns out, like if we already, and you know this from your neuroscience background, Brandy, right? Yeah, that if we have already laid down a learning path for that, then the, the, it takes a lot less calories <laughs> to go down that path again, because it's already there. It's like, it's like a, you're building a little free, a little highway of myelination, right? In, on that, that, that pathway. And so it's gonna just become so easy. Like it's gonna feel easy because it won't take as much effort if you've practiced them outside of the moment. And I love these suggestions, Brandy. You should all read them in the Facebook chat. So good. I'll throw them in here for you, Sonia, too. So sweet. All right. Um, in the Zoom. <laughs> You're welcome, Brandy. OK. So there's a routine question and a high energy, big emotions question here I want to make sure we address. So oh, no, just, just the routine. OK, this is great. And Brandy? I challenge you to like chime in here because we're you just got the routines training. So you might also find yourself um, having things to say here. So this is for Kirsten. And I think your last name is Kanoi. Yeah, I'll tag you so you'll I'll be able to find this. Um, all right, so Kirsten, how do I get my child into a good routine with bedtime and naps without the struggle? Oh, so good. And I'm actually going to do a training for all of my immersion members in August by request, right, Brandy? I don't know if you saw that um, for sleep training. <laughs> yeah, like sleep training big kids too. It's not always like the two-year-olds that need it. It can be all ages of kids. I've got parents who were, came into my world with 10-year-olds who are still needing to be in the room when their kids fall asleep and they just really wanted that 45 minutes back in the evenings knowing their kids were fully capable but just not willing to do it on their own yet. 
So of course, Kirsten, I want to hear more about what kind of struggle you can, you know, come back here and drop drop a note if you'd like. But what um, what I can say is that getting kids into a good routine is one of the keys to unlock like everyday happiness with children. <laughs> because when you don't, when the routines are not running well, it's so obvious and it has such a big impact, right? Like if you have to remind your kid to do things in the morning between 20 and 40 times, like different things, you're tired and they're tired of hearing your voice. And that's not a great way to start the day. Um, and the same thing with bedtime. If you're just like, if the last thing they do is like fight with you about going to sleep, not exactly a great memory for, for, for uh, heading into, into dreams, right? So a couple things about routines and then we're gonna wrap. Although Brandy, I would love to hear what you remember too. So put some stuff in the chat if you're still here. Um, whenever possible, lay out the steps ahead of time mm -hmm. and making sure, like Brandy's saying, yes, good, to set the stage for the next item as you go through the steps. Yeah, good. So you can build in a mini routine within the bedtime routine of like saying goodnight to all of the books and the dolls or something, all the toys, right? Um, of like, turn, you know, maybe turning, turning on a night light and singing a song. There can be these little markers. And what you'll wanna do is outside of the actual nighttime routine is run through it and mention things like, and this is the last thing we do together before you get, tuck, you, you get in bed and lay down. Let's practice that and actually role play through it. It's one of my favorite tips, my top tips that I always make sure to give every person in my world, which is that if you rehearse a routine, almost like a little play, you're going to get so much further when it comes to um, having it go well in the moment. So if you can lay out the steps, build in these little setting the stage moments um, where you're also getting really clear about your expectations, right? Like, okay, this is the part where you lay on your belly and put your arms down and I cover you up with a blanket and then we don't, we're done talking and I only rub your back. Oh, do you want me to rub your back? Okay, remember you need to lay still and no more words. Okay, you ready? Okay, and then you can rub their back. Years in the nap room, friends, hundreds of moments getting kids to sleep. <laughs> the other thing you might wanna do is look into some sleep training. Yeah, and um, Kirsten, if you wanted to jam on that, let me know. Okay, like direct message me so we can talk more because we've run out of time to go through all the sleep training tips. And anyways, that's something that takes a bit more to go through than we can cover in these Monday talks. But I think there's there's something really valuable. Like I've actually worked with families where all we did was work on sleep training. And then we realized there's all these other pieces that like we could continue to work on, but it was like the number one thing that they wanted. And then we, we got it down and it was such a blessing. Like they just got so much of their time back. And then it turned out to be a template for how you can get ahead of every routine and motivate your kids without the, you know, threat of consequences and all the, a lot of the things we talked about today, dealing with that, maybe some sadness or some fr frustration that can come up during those struggles, right? How to be resilient and cope. So it's all like, it's amazing how we can pick one thing and learn so much from it and then take that as a template and apply it to all sorts of situations. Because it's a discovery process, like finding out what coping tool your kid likes, finding out how long of a role play thing can they really tolerate, like maybe it's two minutes, not 10. Um, finding out what, what kinds of ways, what kinds of key questions you can ask that might help your kid get a little more bought into things like chores and homework so that they can feel more motivated. All of these are like little keys that like unlock what, what is now mysterious in terms of your child being resilient, being motivated, being self-regulated, um, and more cooperative and kind of on the same team. And those of you who've been with me for a while can like really know the power of like continuing to just open up all those pieces and um, get to really see the kids and everybody just like in a better groove, having a better time. Um, Cause we only have so much time with each other, right? Life is precious. So thank you for spending some of your time here. Congratulations on leaning in and learning today. Um, we are taking a week off next week because I'm going to take the Monday off after I um, guide my, my immersion members for three straight days on motivation. I'm so excited for it, but um, also know that I'll need that rest. And then we'll be back in two weeks. Um, I'm going to drop the quiz link in the post 
of this um, video. So it'll be in like the text above once we close out so that those of you who want the emotion coaching guide, like a little cheat sheet, which um, a lot of people have found super useful, um, you can have a chance to um, check that out. I also, I can give you the, um, the six, the six strategies for, you know, staying cool and calm in the, in the moments that test your patients the most. Some of you didn't have a chance to grab that yet. So you just put it in your notes on your quiz and I'll make sure to get that to you. Here's what the quiz looks like. Kind of go through and use the, from the framework of the seven pillars of raising resilient children, and just kind of indicate where you feel like you are. Like one would be a beginner, five would be like mastery and something in between. And then at the bottom, if you fill out some information, um, you can let me know here, yes, that you would like the emotion coaching guide and I can make sure to get that to you, okay? And then on the next page, there's an opportunity to also apply for a free strategy session. We'll get you some unique tools just for you, all right? Okay, everybody, well, have a wonderful rest of your week. Brandy, I'll see you soon. Lee, I'll see you soon. Um, Patty, I hope that we can pick up our conversation. Um, and those of you who are new to the group, welcome. I'm so glad you found your way here. Look at how many folks have such great questions. You're in really good company. Always feel free to drop a post with a question or a resource you find. This is a great place to also invite friends in so they can catch these weekly talks and some of the other events that we have right here in the group. And if you have not yet, um, done that, if you haven't yet invited people before, it's really easy. There's this little blue button that's at the top. It says invite. I know Brandy's invited a lot of people, like 30 or something into our group. She's been like one of our major ambassadors. Like when she found us, she's like, every parent I know needs this. And I just love it. Um, but you can come to the group. It looks like this. I'll show you real quick and then we'll go, we'll wrap. It looks like this. And you can just hit, hit this invite button. And when you do that, it'll give you an opportunity to like search for friends. So you can just, let's say you have a Melissa in your world that you wanna invite. And you can see, these are all the Melissa's I know. You can just click the ones that you'd like to invite and it'll go ahead and move them over here. And then you hit send invites. And that's how that works. Yeah. And then you can, it's a free group. So people can just um, make sure they answer the registration questions, let them know that you invited them even better. Um, and then they can come and hang with us. Yeah, we're up to almost 800 members, which is exciting. Our community is growing folks from all over the country and now all over the world. We've got folks from Australia, New Zealand, um, the UK um, and other parts of the world, Mexico, all kinds of places. So yeah, really excited to have you all here and I'll see you next time. Bye, Sonia, on Zoom. See you later. Um, bye, Brandy and others on Facebook. I'll see you next time. Take good care and um, keep, keep trying all these. Feel free to always come in here and replay the videos. You don't necessarily need to catch me live to um, get lots of tips and strategies. And see you next time. Bye for now. <laughs>